Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. I looked at the list of people that have spoken here before, and honestly, I was like, ooh, I've got big shoes to fill. Um, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'll, I'll do the best I can. Luckily, I've got a great topic to talk about. You might not have heard of brown dwarfs before, but I hope by the end of my presentation, you'll think that they're totally awesome and also understand why we really need to understand brown dwarfs in order to understand exoplanets, which is, of course, a super duper hot topic, uh, maybe second only to black holes, which I won't talk about at all. Sorry to disappoint anybody if that disappoints. Um, I thought I'd take a couple minutes just to explain my affiliations a little bit because they are a, a little bit of a mouthful, but they're also um, pretty awesome if I do say so myself. So I have a faculty position at the College of Staten Island, which is one of the only CUNY campuses, it's the only CUNY campus on Staten Island. And Staten Island, just, just in case you don't know, it's the fifth borough, we call it, of New York City, Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, and then the other one that everybody always forgets. And interestingly enough, kind of the most famous things about Staten Island are also how you leave or how you get there. So this is the Verrazano Narrows Bridge between Staten Island and Brooklyn. And then, of course, the best free way to see the Statue of Liberty, which I think is in all of the, the tourist handbooks, but not many of the locals even know, is the Staten Island Ferry, which is free and runs all night. So it's fantastic. And the College of Staten Island is part of CUNY, the City University of New York. It's actually the largest uh, urban public university system in the country. There's 24 campuses across all of the five boroughs and something like 250,000 um, students. And what you might not know is that there's also a, a good amount of astronomers as well. So across not every single campus, but a lot of the campuses, there's about 14 astronomers altogether. So I've highlighted some of my colleagues here from um, the New York City College of Technology, York College, Queensboro, Lehman College, Hunter College, Borough of Manhattan Community College, and a few of us down in Staten Island as well. And we've actually kind of joined together and made ourselves kind of unofficially CUNY astronomy and astrophysics, but it's also a, a fantastic kind of unification of all of the astronomers that are spread out throughout New York City. Um, and what actually brings us together is not part of CUNY, but the American Museum of Natural History. So all of us have research associate positions at the American Museum of Natural History, which is basically a fancy way of saying they don't pay us, but they let us work there, which is, as you can see from this beautiful picture, it's a huge amount of fun. And so this is actually the Rose Center. It's one of the newest buildings that's part of the American Museum of Natural History. The planetarium is actually in this sphere inside. There's actually two theaters in there, the Hayden Planetarium in kind of the top two thirds, and what we call the Big Bang Theater in the bottom third. Um, and it's officially called the Rose Center for Earth and Space, and then the Hayden Planetarium is the sphere inside of that. Um, at the Hayden, or at the, it's a little bit complicated, but as part of the American Museum of Natural History, there's the Department of Astrophysics, and there's three curators in astrophysics, as well as the director of the Hayden Planetarium, a little bit separate, but still part of the department, who you might know, what's his name? That guy. <laughs> yeah, uh, Neil Tyson. I should give him credit, because Neil, without, it's a, a little bit of an aside, but really, when Neil Tyson was hired to renovate the planetarium and take it from the old Art Deco building, the, the kind of brick planetarium that you might be familiar with, and renovate it into this, there was no Department of Astrophysics. And when he got hired, he said, you know, I will come and be the director of the planetarium, but I won't be able to do research anymore, so you also have to hire research astronomers. And that didn't exist in the planetarium um, before he was hired. And so thankfully to him, we now have a, a research department. Thankfully to everybody at CUNY, where we're all kind of spread out around the city, we have this nice central location where we meet up and talk about research. We have our students work there. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal place to be an astronomer. And it's not only astronomy. There's also pretty awesome stuff at the museum as well. There's the, the dinosaurs in you know, every single hall is really special at the museum. So it's a great place to be. And my research group, uh, to, to plug it a little bit, is called Brown Dwarfs in New York City. You can tell we really love being in New York City because it's you know, three-fifths of our name. And we've also used the subway logos for our research group. So we can't sell these. We, we're violating a lot of copyrights here. Um, and it's really fun, actually, because the B and the C trains are the ones that go right past the Museum of Natural History. The Y train, on the other hand, does not exist. There is no Y train. Don't get lost looking for that. So we kind of we use the red for the WNYC, the, the public radio station, 
in New York City because we're nerds like that. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later, there's a joke that we used to have about why trains and an astronomical object. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, so this is not just me, this research group. This research group is actually, I'm proud of it because it's a, a completely female-led research group. We founded it in 2010. With, and my colleagues are my colleagues and co-founders are Jackie Faherty, who's a, now a senior scientist at the Museum of Natural History, and then Kelly Cruz on this side, who is a faculty at Hunter College in CUNY, which is one of the schools in Manhattan in the CUNY system. And the three of us have been leading this research group together for going on seven years now. Um, but we don't do everything. In fact, we do, I, I think, you know, I tell my students we handle the money and the students do all of the work. And so I want to highlight my students here as well. This is a recent group po picture that we took just a few weeks ago, actually, for a going away party. And so this guy who used to be a postdoc in our group is now at um, the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, which is the home of the Hubble Space Telescope and the future James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and so many people actually from BDNYC have moved down there. We have three or four students who previously worked with my group that are now full-time at Space Telescope, and so we've started to call it BDNYC South, but don't tell them that. Um, and so I just, uh, our students range from, let's see, is there, there's no high school students in this picture. Sometimes we do have high school students work with us, to undergrad students from CUNY, from Barnard College, from Columbia University, graduate students from the City University of New York um, Graduate Center, as well as um, uh, Columbia University postdocs and our three faculty and then our, our newest member down here <laughs> who just went back to the hotel room. Um, so they really get all the credit for doing the research in our group. Um, but, but today I'm going to talk to you about brown dwarfs, so the objects that we primarily study. They're not the only objects that we study. We also kind of go into very low mass stars. We also go in the other direction to exoplanets. But I want to explain this whole big picture about what these astronomical objects are, why they're so important, and why we want to study them. Um, and why we study them, probably, perhaps more importantly, why we study them using your tax dollars through uh, grants from the National Science Foundation and NASA. So thank you very much for funding my research. Uh, so brown dwarfs are the astronomical objects that are defined by their mass. That's the, the simplest way to understand them. Also a little bit misleading, which I'll, which I'll get into a little bit later. But the, the kind of existence of brown dwarfs based on their mass was predicted for the first time in 1963 in this paper that's called The Structure of Stars of Very Low Mass by S.S. Kumar. And interestingly enough, when Kumar wrote this paper, it was only a couple of years after his PhD thesis. And so he wrote this groundbreaking breaking paper very soon after he defended his PhD thesis, predicting these objects that were formed like stars, had a structure like stars, but actually didn't have enough mass to become stars. And he worked out what these objects would be like in the early 1960s. Um, and just for reference, I want to remind us of the kind of things that we might be a little bit more familiar with and what their masses are. So astronomers are notorious for making things sometimes a little bit complicated, but sometimes as simple as possible. And so we have the sun. It's over there, just the edge of it on the left. We call it one solar mass. And Jupiter, we call it one Jupiter mass. Easy enough. One solar mass is about 1,000, 1,048, if we want to be precise about it, about 1,048 Jupiter masses. But for the most part, I'm going to talk about, or, yeah, the sun is 1,048 Jupiter masses. So for the most part, I'm going to talk about brown dwarfs in terms of how many times the mass of Jupiter they are. And that's the, not the physical size, not the radius, but the amount of stuff that's actually in the, um, the, the, the object itself. Oh, and then just to remind us how tiny and dinky we are is the Earth down there. And we'll come back to um, tiny and dinky planets at the very, very end. So brown dwarfs are less than 75 Jupiter masses, if we define them by their mass. And this is the minimum mass that's required for hydrogen fusion. So hydrogen fusion is how a star shines, how the sun shines, for example. You have high enough density and pressure at the very, very core of a star that hydrogen atoms can be fused together via a series of nuclear reactions to create a helium atom. And the bottom line is that because the four hydrogen atoms have a little bit more mass than the one helium atom that we end up with at the end of all the series of nuclear reactions, 
you get energy released via E equals MC squared. And so basically, the, the, the possibly the most famous equation in the world that Einstein came up with describes why the sun shines. So in each of these steps, there's a little bit, there's either neutrinos and positrons or gamma ray photons emitted, and energy is released as a net overall um, in this series of reactions. But in order for this to happen, you have to have the atoms of hydrogen moving very quickly in order to overcome the natural repulsion that they feel because they're positively charged. And so at the bottom line, you need a core temperature inside of a star of more than 10 million degrees. In order to get a core this hot, you need to have enough mass pushing down on the outside to keep that high temperature core at the center of an object. And so one of the things that Kumar worked out is that in order to have a 10 million temperature, a 10 million Kelvin degree core, you need more than 75 Jupiter masses to basically ignite hydrogen and make a star shine. And so the, the mass definition of a brown dwarf is that this does not happen. So no nuclear fusion, or at least no hydrogen fusion, going on in the core of a brown dwarf. Strictly the mass definition of that. Um, in, in a lot of properties, though, brown dwarfs are really between stars and planets. So this is a, an artist representation of, again, the edge of the sun over there on the left, just to show how, how big it is. Jupiter over here on the right, and some artist representations of kind of the in-between objects. So the very first thing over there is an M dwarf star. It's the coolest, uh, lowest mass spectral class of stars, and I'll tell you more about those in a second. And then these brown dwarfs are in the middle. And so they're, they're kind of, um, they, the mass decreases this way. And so the M dwarf star is the most massive. It might be 80 or 90 times the mass of Jupiter. Jupiter over here is one times the mass of Jupiter. And then these objects in between are, this one's a little bit more massive. This one's a little bit less massive. But this artist's representation nicely depicts all of these at about the same size. And that's really what we think they are. So there's a, there's a limit to which these objects can shrink that makes them all about the size of Jupiter. And so the mass decreases this way, even though the size stays the same. And so the density is also going to decrease for these objects as we move between the very low mass star and Jupiter over here. Um, and so I, I've also labeled the sun as a G2 V star. And so because I've labeled the sun and because I've labeled this M dwarf star, I want to um, teach you, if you haven't learned it before, or remind you, if you have learned it before, how we classify stars in this wonderfully very messed up alphabet. <laughs> so the astronomer's alphabet is basically O-B-A-F-G-K-M. And now there's some new letters at the end. I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, stars are assigned these letters that we call spectral types according to their color and their temperature. They're really assigned the, 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 the letters based on how their spectra look, but we've since, since this um, scheme kind of came into existence about 100 years ago, or was invented by astronomers really, we now know that it's the temperature of the stars that determines their spectral type. And in fact, this sequence, it was originally in alphabetical order, the way that the stars were first classified. It was the, the details of it was that the system was um, set up to order the stars by the strengths of hydrogen absorption lines. And the A stars had the strongest hydrogen absorption lines, the B stars had the second strongest hydrogen absorption lines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this was in the early 1900s, and it was, being, it was work that was being done at the Harvard College Observatory. And interestingly enough, it was work that was being done mostly by women. And one of those women was Annie Jump Cannon, who I hope everybody in this room knows, maybe. She was actually born in Dover, Delaware. And Cannon Hall, the dormitory on, um, on campus that's Cannon Hall is named after Annie Jump Cannon. So she was one of these astronomers that worked at the Harvard College Observatory, taking the, the data that was collected by the male astronomers who were considered like the research astronomers. They were the ones that had the researcher positions, professor positions, and things like that. And, but there was also a group of women that worked at the observatory that were considered the computers kind of like the computers in the Hidden Figures movie or in, in NASA at the time because it was really based on a true story. Even before that, it was the women that did the organization, the classification, the calculations in order to take observations. So in the middle, I'm showing this the actual spectra that Annie worked with and published. And they basically 
defined and then classified stars into these categories. And Annie Cannon herself, still unmatched, I think, by anybody, probably even by computers, personally classified over 300,000 stars, according to this system. And it was just a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal body of work that she did. And possibly because she classified them all herself, this system has effectively lived on till today. We haven't changed it very much. We've added a little bit of details here and there to add classifications for gravity and for variability and peculiarity and things like that. But overall, it's worth learning this messed up alphabet because this is the way that astronomers understand stars. Um, so there's some great mnemonics that you can go online to, to find out about. The mnemonic I think that Annie actually came up with herself is, oh, be a fine girl or guy and kiss me. When she came up with, yeah, it's a little cute. Maybe it's a little bit sexist, but since I, I think she came up with it herself, and so we'll let that one slide. But sometimes um, a lot of my colleagues will have their students come up with new ones, for example. Um, as maybe as extra credit or something like that. One of my favorite new ones that my students came up with is Outback Australia for good kangaroo meat. I haven't confirmed that. I will neither confirm nor deny it, but th there's, a, there's a ton more of those um, online. What we have had to do with the spectral classification system is update it a little bit very wonderfully because, like I said, the M dwarfs are the lowest mass, the smallest, and the coolest class of stars. But the brown dwarfs are actually even cooler, even lower mass than that. And so since Annie's classification system, we've actually added three new spectral classes of stars. So we have the L and the T dwarf, and we have the Y dwarf. And actually, this is where my joke comes in from my BDNYC and that, that Y train logo, because the L and the T dwarfs were discovered when the original brown dwarfs were discovered, which even though Kumar predicted the existence of these objects in the 1960s, the first brown dwarfs weren't actually confirmed until about the mid-1990s. And so actually a conference that we had here in, in Delaware just across the hall a couple years ago was just about for the 20th anniversary of the discovery of the first, um, it was actually the first a T dwarf that was kind of confirmed first. And then the L dwarfs are a little bit since they're a little bit more similar to stars, it's a little bit harder to, to tell that it's definitely a brown dwarf and not a star. And so it's really a T dwarf that was confirmed first. But we didn't actually have any Y dwarfs until about 2011. We had picked out the letter and we said, okay, if there's objects that are cooler than the T dwarfs, we're gonna call them Y dwarfs. And there's actually a paper that has a, a wonderful table in it that goes through all of the letters of the alphabet and explains why we can't use certain letters that H is already used for hydrogen and too many things. And it's a, you wouldn't think that the alphabet would be necessarily so important to astronomers, but it's relatively important to research astronomy. Um, but we hadn't discovered any of the objects yet until a space mission called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer done by NASA launched in, I believe in the late 2009. And that survey actually found some of these Y dwarfs. And so for a little while, we had a joke where I said, when I showed my BDNYC logo, I said, there's no Y train, but there's also no Y dwarfs either. And so it was a little bit of a joke there. But now we have the Y dwarfs. There's a handful of them that have been discovered, about a, a couple dozen or so. There's still no Y train in New York City. And so my joke kind of has to end there. So the, the three new spectral classes of brown dwarfs are the L dwarf, the T dwarf and the Y dwarf, you know, kind of approximately in alphabetical order, but Lord help me if I have to actually say the regular alphabet anymore, I can't do it. I only know the astronomy alphabet. So why do we study these objects? First of all, because they're, they're there, and that's one of the wonderful things that we get to do as astronomers is basically study anything that, that is out there in the universe. Um, but why do we think these objects are interesting and important? One of the first things is that brown dwarfs might actually be the most numerous star-like objects in the galaxy. So here's an artist's representation of our galaxy. We can't actually take a picture like this because we're sitting in the galaxy, but we can kind of measure from our perspective where clumps of stars are and where we think the arms are and things like that to make a little bit of a map. So this is a, what we think is nicely realistic, even if it's not an actual picture. And just to remind you that we're out here in the boondocks. The sun is really about two thirds of the way out from the center of the galaxy in one of the spiral arms. And if you take kind of all of the nearby objects, just stuff in, in a relatively nearby neighborhood and you put it on a scale like this, the most massive stars are gonna dominate the mass but there's actually not that many of those massive stars. 
When the universe forms stars, it turns out that the universe forms many more of these very, very low mass stars. This is something that's technically called the initial mass function. It just tells us how many objects are created at different masses. And since we found these objects and started mapping where they are and kind of cataloging them in the last couple decades, we've realized that there's a lot more of the low mass stars than there are of the high mass stars. And so just by number, if you care about how many of the things there are, brown dwarfs are, are really ubiquitous out there. And so in order to understand everything that's in the universe, we definitely can't leave off the brown dwarfs. Another interesting thing about them is that they're actually some of our closest, I put stellar in quotation marks because they're not really stars, but they're much closer than we would have thought before we um, knew them or before we actually found the first few. Um, and so this uh, image is an artist's representation of the sun as viewed from our next closest neighbor, neighbor the Alpha Centauri star system. Um, and so Alpha Centauri is the closest star system to Earth. It's actually a triple system. There's a binary star. This one's actually a binary star. And then there's uh, an M dwarf companion. And you might have heard of the M dwarf companion recently in the news because it has a planet around it we now know. And so this is probably the, the closest Earth-like planet besides our own um, that we're ever going to find because this is the closest star system to the Earth. Um, but what you might not know about is that actually not that much further away, there's a couple brown dwarfs, three brown dwarfs actually, that were only discovered in the last few years. So you might think that the list of the, the closest star systems is not something that's going to change. But actually, it does change. And it's kind of exciting that we, we, there's things in our backyard that we don't even necessarily know about. And you can see there, these things are not very bright. They're very, very dim, very, very cool. There are some of these lowest... Um, coolest, lowest mass, um, faintest classes of stars. So the WISE 0855 is actually so cool that it's, it's not much warmer than, I think, a lukewarm cup of coffee. And this binary star system is, one is an L dwarf and one is a T dwarf, I believe, for that binary brown dwarf system. And again, only discovered in the last few years with this wide field infrared survey explorer. And so that's why their, their license plate names there start with WISE for that spacecraft that I'll show you in just a minute, actually. Um, oh, and one of the things that I want to say is that we're still looking for these things. So there is a possibility. Of course, the sun is, is way too huge. Um, the distances are to scale, but the sizes of the objects are not to scale. And so even between the sun and the next closest star system, there's a huge amount of empty space. And these brown dwarfs are so low mass, so cool, so dim, that there might actually be more objects in between the sun and the closest star system that we haven't yet discovered. Kind of similar to how there might be a planet nine at the very, very outer edge of the solar system that's even bigger than Pluto um, that people are looking for. We're also looking for more massive objects, but slightly further away in this kind of just next door, just in our backyard um, region of the solar neighborhood. And there's actually a citizen science project, which is something where we make the data public provide the public with tools to do some astronomical analyses and have hopefully people make discoveries for us is what we do. And so instead of having kind of women computers, we can have everybody at their computers do this work. And one of the newer projects is called Backyard Worlds. And it's actually um, my colleague and co-founder of BDNYC, Jackie Faherty, is involved with this. So if you go to backyardworlds.org, you can read about the data that they have, and you can learn how to look at these astronomical images and see if you can find nearby brown dwarfs in their data. So that's really exciting that all of these are public, and I hope you can look through that data and hopefully help us find more of these nearby objects. Another thing about the brown dwarfs is that, as I kind of hinted at earlier in showing the brown dwarfs next to Jupiter, and they're all about the same size, brown dwarfs are actually very similar to gas giant planets like Jupiter. And in fact, gas giant planets around other stars that are even more massive to Jupiter, that are even more massive than Jupiter, are even more similar to the brown dwarfs. And I'll talk about that as I talk about, um, as I get into the exoplanets. But the brown dwarfs, because they're not around a star necessarily, because they're out there on their own in space, they're much easier to find and they're much easier to study in detail. I'll show you when we study the exoplanets, we're always going to be limited in the data that we can get because the exoplanet is right next to a star in the sky because it has to be orbiting 
a star. And so we're going to be very limited as to the data that we can get on a planet, but we can get a lot of information about a brown dwarf. And then we can hopefully take that information that we learn about the brown dwarf and apply it to the exoplanet. I'll have a ton more information about that later on because that's really, you know, when, when you say exoplanets, NASA's eyes light up and their pockets get a little bit looser. And so when we apply for grants, we definitely talk about how brown dwarfs are important for understanding exoplanets. And it's true. That's the nicest thing is that it's true. So how do astronomers study exoplanets? We, um, we observe them not in visible light because these things are so low mass, so cool, and so faint that they actually don't emit a lot of visible light at all. And this is one of the reasons that it took several decades to find them even after they were, uh, after they were predicted to exist in the 1960s. So here I have a little bit of physics for you, but it's really not that bad. There, these curves are called thermal spectra. And these thermal spectra are the result of quantum mechanics, which I won't go into. But they basically show us how much light is emitted at different wavelengths by objects with different temperatures. And you can see that the top curve that I have there is the sun. And so it's about 6,000 Kelvin at the surface. It, this, this thermal spectrum of the sun peaks in visible light, in the visible rainbow that our eyes are sensitive to and that our Earth's atmosphere is transparent to, which probably neither of those things are co of our coincidence. And they're definitely very handy for us. And you can see as we go to cooler and cooler temperatures, the curve decreases overall. So I have different dashes there for the different temperatures. And so as an object gets cooler, it emits less light at every single temperature, or less light, sorry, at every single wavelength. But as it also gets cooler, as the object gets cooler, the curve kind of shifts, the peak of the curve shifts to longer and longer wavelengths. And so a brown dwarf is actually even cooler than the bottom curve I have on here that's about 3,000 degree, degrees Kelvin. And you can kind of barely see that the 3,000 degree Kelvin curve peaks outside of the visible part of the spectrum. So these objects are actually so cool that they hardly emit any visible light at all. They emit most of their light at infrared wavelengths. So infrared longer than our eyes can see wavelengths of radiation. Um, and just for fun, and because NASA made these images available, I have images of animals taken at infrared wavelengths. And you, so you can see that the, the kind of yellow to white is brighter, and the red to purple to blue is darker or cooler. And so the turtle here has been sitting in the sun. The elephant has their trunk in the, in the water there, so it's nice and cool. And so the hotter something is, the more light it emits. The cooler something is, the less light it emits, and the more light it emits at longer wavelengths of light. And so we study brown dwarfs because they're so cool. We study them at infrared wavelengths of light. And because they're so faint, we also want to study them with big telescopes. This, the brown dwarfs, even if you had, say, infrared binoculars or an infrared backyard telescope or something like that, this, these brown dwarfs are still not something you would be able to see really without a professional telescope. So the bigger the telescope you have, the larger the, the essentially the bucket you have to collect light, the fainter the object you can see in a given amount of time. And so the larger the object you have, the fainter the object you can see in a, in a reasonable amount of time, really. And so I wanted to pick out not the biggest telescope in the world, but one of the biggest and my favorite, because these are the telescopes I got to use when I was doing my PhD thesis at UCLA. These are the Keck telescopes on, on Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii that are uh, 10, di 10 meter diameter primary mirrors. And so these are the two domes. And you can kind of see um, the, the mirror structure inside of each of the domes. And then this is a close up of the mirror structure and the hexagonal mirror. You can see the outline of it. It's a little bit tricky to see a mirror like this in, in the image because you've got everything reflected and so sometimes it can be hard to pick it out. Um, but this opening in the center is about a meter across and so that's a kind of person size or a little bit smaller than a person size in the center there. So these are just huge, huge structures. Um, and the bigger the telescope, the better. We can use smaller telescopes, maybe one to three to five meters, but the bigger the telescope, the better, the better to see these faint objects. Um, it's also fantastic to put telescopes in space. Uh, we've definitely used the Hubble Space Telescope to observe these objects. One of the first T-dwarf that was confirmed uh, was also imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope. And then the two on the left are the WISE telescope is the one that I mentioned before that was the survey launched in 2009. That it's, so it was a wide field survey 
a wide field telescope that essentially surveyed the entire sky at infrared wavelengths of light. And so because it surveyed the entire sky, there's a huge amount of data. You can look through that data to try to find the brown dwarfs in that data because it also observed the sky at several different wavelengths of light. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope is also an infrared space telescope, but instead of surveying the whole sky, it can make pointed observations. And so basically, once we know about the brown dwarfs, we know where they are, we can point the Spitzer Space Telescope at it and, and take more detailed infrared observations of these brown dwarfs. Um, both of these telescopes are limited in their lifetimes because unlike the Hubble Space Telescope that mostly operates at visible light, wave, um, yeah, visible light wavelengths, a little bit in the infrared, a little bit in the ultraviolet as well, the WISE and Spitzer spacecraft operate only in the infrared and even much longer wavelengths where even space isn't cold enough to make these detectors work in the infrared. And so they actually had coolant on the spacecraft, but that coolant only lasts for a couple of years. And so the longest wavelength observations that were um, capable originally with the, those instruments on WISE and Spitzer no longer work. But there's still a couple channels of relatively uh, shorter infrared wavelength observations that still work. And so these spacecraft are still making observations, even if it's not the full suite of instruments that they had when they were launched. Um, and then the next telescope that we're very, very excited about that, like I said, is going to be run out of the Space, Time, Space, Science, Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where the Hubble is run out of, is the James Webb Space Telescope. And this, you should definitely mark your calendars, this is going to be launched in October of 2018. Um, and it's going to be also operating primarily in the infrared, which is very exciting. Um, and it will also have a slightly limited lifetime. It might only last for five or 10 years. Unlike the Hubble Space, Te Space Telescope, which is now, let's see, I think Hubble just turned 27 because it was launched in 1990. And this will have a limited lifetime, but it's still going to be phenomenal. And unlike Hubble, which is in a low Earth orbit, so it was accessible for servicing missions by the astronauts and the space shuttle, the James Webb Space Telescope will actually be a million miles away instead of just a couple hundred up off the Earth. It'll be a million miles away past the moon. The moon is about a quarter of a million miles away. And so James Webb Space Telescope is going to be even further than the moon, always um, past the Earth, away from the sun. And so very nicely, they call the position where it's going to be a million miles past midnight, which is kind of cool. Um, October 2018, that's going to launch. And it's, oh man, if you want to keep yourself up at night, especially if you're an astronomer and engineer, this um, kind of blanket that the, the primary mirror of the telescope is sitting on is a sunshade. And so that will actually always face the sun in order to protect the telescopes from the sun. And that, you might expect, doesn't, this whole thing actually doesn't fit in any of the rockets that we have. And so this whole thing, and actually, man, I could give a whole talk about the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll try to move on pretty quickly. But this is such an exciting time right now because the whole top part of this is actually put together in the lab at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And there's a webcam that's always on it. It's called the, the webcam for the James Webb Space Telescope, two Bs. I know, I didn't think of that. I wish I did. Um, I'm not sure if their webcam has one B or two Bs, but probably both will, if you Google it, will bring it up. Um, and you can see this in the clean room. And it's a, like in a, it's a thing that astronomers, anytime they visit the James Webb or the, the Goddard Space Flight Center, they say, I want to go take a selfie with, with the telescope. <laughs> And you can get a nice selfie if it's pointed in the right direction, depending on the tests that they're doing. You can get a nice selfie of yourself reflected in the gold of the mirrors, which is just amazing. And you know, pretty soon we're going to send this into space, and so you won't be able to do that anymore. Um, this whole thing is going to get folded up to go into a rocket. The, I think the mirror folds up, the secondary mirror um, struts fold up, the sun shield folds up. The whole thing's got to go out and unfold. And it's it's. That, like that doing that kind of engineering maneuver in space is just mind blowing to me. Um, I did go to a talk by a, uh, an astronomer who works in policy that said that the engineers that are working on this, and this is a little bit classified, but he said it, so I'm going to say it. They're not nervous about the telescope opening up, the people that are doing this. And that's probably because there's telescopes like this in space already pointed down instead of up. But those telescopes don't need the sunshade. And so the sunshade, because those telescopes are working in visible light, not in infrared light. And so the, um, you can think about why that is. But 
the sunshade hasn't been done before. And so that's the part that they're really nervous about. And this is something like the size of a uh, tennis court that's going to open up in space. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm excited about it. Um, excited and very, very nervous. Um, so this is also going to be a great way to study brown dwarfs. And in fact, astronomers are already thinking about um, proposing for time. It's going to be very competitive to get time to observe on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, but actually, here at the University of Delaware, you've got Professor John Gizis that is, that is leading one of the teams for brown dwarf researchers to propose observations for the James Webb Space Telescope. And so that's super, super exciting. Um, and so, so in addition to using all of these telescopes, looking in the infrared, using big telescopes, using telescopes in space, we also want to observe brown dwarfs by, very specifically, by looking at their spectra. And so the spectrum is the, the light from the object spread out into these different wavelengths. And so Pink Floyd nicely reminds us that if we take white visible light and spread it out according to its wavelengths, we get a beautiful rainbow because the white light is actually the combination of all of the different colors of the spectra. Um, so this is a nice one, but, but Pink Floyd also lied to you because there is no dark side of the moon. It was just the far side, but the far side is lit up during a new moon phase. Okay, so I give Pink Floyd a little bit of credit, but I always have to remind people about that. Um, so these are some spectra of brown dwarfs. It, it looks a little bit messy, but what I want to point out is that the, the spectra is a very, very powerful tool because taking the light and spreading out according to wavelength uh, reveals basically fingerprints of atoms and molecules that are actually in the brown dwarfs themselves. This is true for stars as well. And in fact, the first spectrum, um, the first solar spectrum of this, the, the first spectrum of the sun taken in visible light was where helium was discovered. Helium was discovered actually in the atmosphere of the sun before it was discovered on Earth. Um, and so these, these spectra of the brown dwarfs tells us about the, their properties. I call it the atmospheres of the brown dwarfs, but I don't want to mislead you because these things don't have atmospheres like we would think of on Earth. It's not like air on top of solid ground or anything like that. It's more like atmospheres like in a gas giant planet, like gas all the way through like Saturn or like Jupiter. Um, but in the atmospheres of these brown dwarfs, that's how we basically understand what's going on. That's how we understand how similar these things are to, are to stars and how similar they are to gas giant planets or exoplanets around other stars. Um, and I've labeled some of the, the more interesting uh, compounds on here that we can see in the spectra. So there's spectra of going from an M object at the top to an L object at the bottom. Um, th these are the spectral types that I mentioned at the beginning. And there's a little number after each one of them. And what I didn't tell you at the beginning is that uh, the O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and then L, T, and Y, we even break those letters up in further into number classifications. So each one of those letters has a, a, a secondary classification of 0 through 9, where 0 is the hottest one of that spectral class, and then 9 is the coolest part of that spectral class. And so we take the alphabet mess it up, and then basically make it even more complicated, because that's what we can do. Um, and what I, one of the other things that I want to point out is that visible light, the light that we can see with our eyes, ends at about 7,000. Um, this, this should be angstroms right here. And so um, it's a unit of wavelength, but basically 7,000 is the longest wavelength we can see with our eyes. And so all of this other light over here is infrared light that we can't see with our eyes. Longer wavelengths we can see with our eyes. And you can see from the very bottom spectrum that it's you know, very close to zero, way past that 7,000. And it only increases, so it only really gets brighter at these infrared wavelengths of light. And the higher spectra are really the same way. They're just offset for clarity in here. So each of these objects um, is also essentially invisible, invisible light, and then only apparent at longer infrared wavelengths of light. And you can see some of the compounds in here. So there's water, there's iron hydride, titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, sodium, potassium, hydrogen, um, chromium hydride, calcium hydride. There's all kinds of atoms and molecules that are absorbing light um, from the, the atmosphere of the brown dwarf bef before the light reaches us. And using these absorption lines, we can kind of understand the properties of the objects. So here's zooming out in wavelength a little bit, a little bit more squiggly lines, because this is where my bread and butter is. But I'll go back to the pretty pictures soon, I promise. Um, another like set of objects at different 
temperatures, starting with about a 3,000 Kelvin, probably a, a very, very low mass star, um, a 1,700 Kelvin L-type brown dwarf, a 700 Kelvin T-type brown dwarf, and then a 125 Kelvin Jupiter. And you can see that it starts out, um, so I've zoomed out in wavelength here. So this is wavelength in microns at the bottom. And so visible light is, let's see, one micron, nine, eight, seven. Visible light is all the way over here. And so even more into the infrared, we're going on this side. And so for the star, you can kind of see that it's a smooth curve. And it's actually very, very similar to that thermal spectrum that I showed you very uh, uh, much further in the beginning with the, the, um, the 6,000 Kelvin curve plotted on there as well. But there's, it, it's still a little bit messy. There's still a lot of absorption from, from water and things, and it's not a very smooth curve. And that's because stars are, are not quite perfect, almost perfect, but not quite. Um, but you could definitely like draw a smooth line through there and make it fairly, fairly flat. As the objects get cooler and cooler, the atmospheres get so much more complex. You have molecules forming. You have um, more neutral atoms. And you have them doing their, their, they're kind of absorbing more and more of the light coming out from the star before it reaches us. And so this, the spectrum kind of starts to have these big dips in it that are basically light that's taken out by the atoms and molecules in the outer layers of these objects until you get cooler and cooler. And these, the, this absorption becomes so huge that actually it kind of inverts. And instead of having what, what's obviously absorption from a smooth line, you kind of have peaks that are in between the, the um, opacity windows. So mainly from water, also from methane, and from ammonia as you get cooler and cooler. And so I want to, to emphasize that these, these peaks are actually very similar in the brown dwarf and in the Jupiter temperature object. And it's by studying these peaks that we understand the temperature and the composition of these brown dwarf objects. But that's not all. Because these brown dwarfs don't fuse hydrogen into helium like stars do, they actually continuously change over their lifetimes. So I could also do a whole other talk about the, the lifetimes of stars. But just in case you didn't know it, the, the sun is about halfway through its 10 billion year lifetime. And so in about 5 billion years, the sun will cease to be able to fuse hydrogen into helium. It won't shine anymore. And it'll explode, not super dramatically. It won't be a supernova. It'll explode in what's called a, a planetary nebula. And the sun itself will shrink to a white dwarf. So we've got a 5 billion years left to enjoy. Um, well, well, it won't be a temperate Earth for very long because the oceans will boil off in a few hundred million years or so if we don't make it even worse before that. Um, but for the most part, you know, in the big picture of things, this, the sun is kind of nice and steady for about 10 billion years, fusion hydrogen and helium staying about the same temperature. A brown dwarf, on the other hand, because it doesn't have this, this steady source of fuel of the fusion of hydrogen and the helium, the brown dwarf is actually going to continuously cool and fade over its lifetime. So this is also a fairly technical plot, but I'm going to try to walk you through it. On the y-axis over there is temperature from high temperature to low temperature, so warm to cold. Over here, I've tried to associate those temperatures with the spectral types. Again, the letters and then the numbers after the letters. Because for the most part, we like to think that when we assign um, a spectral type to a particular object, we think that that corresponds to a temperature. And so that's why one is on, on that side, the other one is on this side. We think that we can draw a line across and say an L7 is about 1,500 Kelvin. It's not really that easy, but that's where my job security comes in. Um, and then each one of these different colored lines is an object of a particular mass in Jupiter masses. So I have labeled 100 Jupiter masses, 13 Jupiter masses, 75 Jupiter masses. We know why 75 is important already, because 75 is the difference between a star and a brown dwarf. And I'll, I'll explain why 13 Jupiter masses is important in a second. And then one Jupiter mass at the very, very bottom. And so for an object of a given mass, it's going to change according to this curve in temperature over time. And so the time is down here at the bottom, 1 million years at the very end. That's about how long it takes a star to form, approximately. 10 million years, 100 million years, 1 billion years, and 10 billion years. So it's a logarithmic scale. Each um, uh, big tick mark is a factor of 10. 
And what we can see is that the blue lines all represent objects of stellar mass. So they're objects above 75 Jupiter masses. And they decrease a little bit, then they flatten out. They decrease again, and then they flatten out eventually over here. And these stars are actually, they, this is when they're fusing hydrogen into helium. It takes a long time for them to actually begin to steadily fuse hydrogen into helium. But once they do it, they're going to last for probably trillions of years. And I say probably because the universe is only 13.7 billion years old. And so these very low mass stars are probably going to outlast possibly the universe itself. Um, when we get to the brown dwarfs, though, they flatten out a little bit, but then they cool again, and they continue cooling. So they don't ever flatten out in temperature. They don't ever reach a steady temperature. They continue cooling and cooling in time, with time. Um, and this flattening out over here is basically me lying to you a little bit at the very beginning. <laughs> because at the very beginning of the talk, I said that brown dwarfs do not fuse hydrogen into helium. And that's true. They don't fuse hydrogen into helium, but they can actually fuse deuterium into helium. And deuterium is heavy hydrogen. It's basically hydrogen with not just a proton at the, at the atom or in the nucleus of the atom, but with a proton and a neutron. And because of that neutron, it makes it slightly easier to fuse. And so the brown dwarfs, even though they don't have enough mass to steadily fuse hydrogen into helium, they can fuse the slightly easier to fuse deuterium into helium. And so that will produce the energy for a little bit of the lifetime of the brown dwarf, but there's not much deuterium around. And so eventually they can't do that, and they'll continue cooling again. And like I said, they continue cooling and fading with time. And then this 13 Jupiter masses, the lines change in color again. And I have the 13, um, the 13 to 1 Jupiter mass tracks in red labeled as planets. This is also kind of a lie. <laughs> there is a difference between the green lines and the blue lines. You'll see that all, almost all of the green lines flatten out for that deuterium fusion, but the red lines don't really flatten out at all. And that's because there's a, a minimum mass for deuterium fusion as well. So 75 Jupiter masses is the minimum mass for hydrogen fusion. More massive than that, you're going to be a star. And it turns out 13 Jupiter masses is the minimum mass for deuterium fusion. So when astronomers were first kind of distinguishing brown dwarfs from stars and from planets, they said, we're going to call 13 Jupiter masses the boundary between brown dwarfs and planets. And we're going to say, if you don't fuse anything at all, you're a planet. And that's the 13 Jupiter masses. Ugh. It's not great. It's a not a great definition, which I'll explain later. And in fact, if I were this one particular astronomer, um, by the name of David Latham, I would be very, very pissed about that. Because he actually found one of the first exoplanets, but it was above 13 Jupiter masses. Well, at the time when they first found it, they thought it was above 13 Jupiter masses. So there was no fanfare. People didn't think it was a planet at all. Now I think there's two things that have happened. One, we don't necessarily care about this 13 Jupiter mass distinction anymore, and I'll explain why. And number two, I think the measurements have gotten better, and so his object is actually less than the 13 Jupiter masses, and still nobody knows his name, which is unfortunate. Um, but I, I think he's OK with that. Um, so these brown dwarfs cool, fade, and shrink with time, which is, on one hand, useful, but on the other hand, very, very confusing. And the reason that it's confusing is going back to the temperature. So say I find. Um, an L5 object or so. So I have the spectral type. I think that corresponds to a temperature. I have a brown dwarf according to my spectral definitions. But according to mass, I don't know what I have. So I've drawn the line all the way across here. And depending on the age of the object, so I've picked out a few example ages. If I have a very, very young object, I actually have a planetary mass object, something that might be 10 or 12 times the mass of Jupiter. If I have a middle age object, maybe 50 million years old or so. Sometimes we call it juvenile, actually. It's still pretty young for a, for, a, for a star. It might be a brown dwarf. But if that object is more like a few billion years old, then it can actually be a stellar mass object and not a brown dwarf at all. And so the, the correspondence of temperature with mass actually depends on the age of the objects. And so one of the things that we try to do as brown dwarf astronomers is actually figure out the ages of these different objects in order to be able to figure out what masses they are. Um, it's much more difficult than it sounds, and I could also do a whole talk on that. And it's one of the things that um, Professor John Gieses is working on here as well. 
But like I said, it's also job security to not totally understand the objects. Um, and so I want to move on to the exoplanets because this is, even though I said, you know, we say it to NASA, I kind of like started putting it in grants after I finished my PhD and when I started applying for own, my own grants, kind of not necessarily really believing it. I was like, you know, this would definitely be cool if it were true and it's going to get me funded and it worked. But in the back of my head, I was like, you know, I'm kind of spinning things a little bit. I got comfortable with it. But the, the best thing is that it turned out to be true. It's very, very exciting. Um, is that these brown dwarfs are actually very similar to the exoplanets. But like I said, the, we started out having this mass-based definition of a brown dwarf um, versus a star, as well as a brown dwarf versus a planet. For the brown dwarfs versus a star, the mass definition works out well because the, the objects change fundamentally differently. They live kind of fundamentally differently depending on whether they fuse hydrogen into helium or whether they don't. They either flatten out and stay the same temperature for trillions of years, or they continuously cool and fade with time. Um, but for the distinction between a brown dwarf and a planet, it's not that really that much of a, that's not that big of a deal. There's a little bit of a wonkiness in these curves just because they're models, and so there's a little bit lack of understanding there. But really, eventually, they all cool and fade with time. So they end up kind of being very, very similar in their evolution throughout their lifetimes. And so in that case, what really distinguishes a planet from a brown dwarf? And luckily, um, Beyonce has the answer. The answer is formation. That's OK, thanks, guys. <laughs> um, but the answer is really formation. This is, this is, I still haven't seen Lemonade. I've got to watch Lemonade, but I, I know better. Um, the, the bottom line is that brown dwarfs form like stars do. This is something that Kumar, like that's what he started with. He said, what if these objects form like stars but don't have enough mass? And further observations have actually shown that, in fact, brown dwarfs do form like stars. So this is an observation of baby stars forming stars taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And they, they, they're forming out there on their own. They're in um, a cloud of gas and dust that's surrounding them that they're forming from. Both of these are... are um, too low mass to be stars, but they're forming like stars. They look like baby stars, but they end up like planets. They, they don't have this hydrogen fusion going on to, to have them stably produce energy over trillions. Um, so brown dwarfs form like the stars, but planets have to form in disks around stars. So this is an artist's representation of kind of the different stages of star formation. At the top, I have a brown dwarf forming from a collapsing cloud of gas and dust. We think that it, that it might share a lot of the stages of star formation. So the, the cloud starts to, um, as the core col collapses at the center, the, um, the cloud starts to spin faster, and the dust and gas around the object starts to flatten into a disk. You have the, the object at the very, very center collapsing faster, getting a little bit hotter. For a star to ignite and fuse hydrogen into helium, start producing a lot of energy. The brown dwarf. You know, it might fuse deuterium a little bit. It'll definitely get warmer as it collapses. It won't necessarily ignite, but it'll stay warm for a little while. The disk will dissipate, and then the object, if it's a brown dwarf, will cool and fade with time. Um, the star just basically starts with a bigger cloud, and the planet forms out of the disk around that star. And so this is, is a pretty straightforward definition based on formation, but not based on mass. Because you can imagine this, um, the, the top row of the brown dwarf forming, we think we can form pretty small things that still formed like a star. So maybe 10 or 15 Jupiter masses. As well, if we have a really massive star, we might be able to form a fairly massive object in its disk, maybe 15, 20, 30, maybe even 40 Jupiter masses. And so by the mass definition, this could be a planet and this could be a brown dwarf. But really, the formation is probably the better way to define things, with the, the planet forming in the disk around the object and the brown dwarf forming on its own like a star. In theory, it's, it's easy to say this. In practice, it's actually fairly tricky to determine how something formed. And I'll get back to that um, uh, a little bit later. First, I want to move on to the exoplanets before I confuse things even more. Because the exoplanets are just, again, this could be Probably not even just one talk, but a whole semester's worth of talks. So the bottom line is that astronomers have discovered 
thousands of exoplanets. So there's still some students in the audience. I want to do this. How many of you were born after 1995? I see you. Oh my gosh. Look at all of them. You don't know a world without these exoplanets. That's what I want to point out. You can tell, you know, ask your parents when phones used to have cords on them and stuff like that. More importantly, the whole time that you were alive, Hubble was up in orbit around Earth, and we've known that there are thousands of exoplanets. I want you to put yourself in your parents' shoes, not having the Hubble Space Telescope, not knowing that there are planets around other stars. Um, this is just a, a, I really think that this, the 1995, when the first exoplanet was discovered, is the, the definition of a new generation. Now, you know, my son and um, all the college students already don't know a world without knowing that there are planets around other stars, which is just mind blowing to me. Um, but most of these planets, even though I can show this pretty picture of hundreds of different planets of these gorgeous rainbows colors with rings and everything like that, most of these are very, very fake. Artist representations of information that we try to convey, but really most of these planets are detected indirectly. And I want to, just for a reminder, um, I want to show you how the planets were discovered. The star over here in orbit and a planet in orbit around the star. So the thing is, so we know that planets orbit around the sun, but actually because gravity is a force and forces are equal and opposite, the star is also going to move as well. And so the sun, as the planets orbit it, the sun is actually moving back and forth as well. This is called a reflex motion. And so as the planet orbits the star, the star actually orbits a, a, a tiny little bit. It moves a tiny little bit in the same period, in the same amount of time, but in the opposite direction. And so because we can look at this star and because we can see absorption lines from the atoms and molecules in the atmosphere of that star and the very outer layers of that star, we know what wavelengths those are supposed to be at and we can watch those lines shift as the star moves towards and away from us. And so as the star moves towards and away from us, we can essentially map out the orbit of the star and then back out the orbit of the planet that has to be causing that reflex motion. So that's the, that's the video of it, um, and here's some of the data. This is actually data for the very first exoplanet that was discovered around a sun-like star. Um, and if, if you think about doing this for the solar system, the planet that's going to cause the biggest reflex motion in, in the sun is Jupiter, because Jupiter is the most massive planet, and this is basically a result of gravity. But for Jupiter to go once all the way around, we need to wait 11 years. And not only just wait 11 years, but actually take spectra of the sun during that time in order to map out the entire uh, series of reflex motion. It looks like a nice sine curve for a circular orbit. Um, but you can see up here it says P equals 4.2 D. That P is for period, and so it's the amount of time it takes the planet to go once all the way around, and that D is for days. So this very first planet was, that was discovered actually orbits its host star in just four days, which is a phenomenally short amount of time, which according to Kepler's third law, means that the planet has to be very, very close to its star. And so this is the, the phase is just one period from zero to one, is one orbit of the planet around the star. Um, and in fact, this planet, is, this type of planet is called a hot Jupiter because it's a relatively massive planet. This planet in particular, 51 Peg B, named after the star that it was found around, is about half the mass of Jupiter. But at 4.2 days, it's very, very close to its host star. And so the thing is absolutely fried. Um, but it turns out that these, these planets are much easier to find closer to their host star, because we just don't have to watch the, the observe the star for as long in order to find these planets. According to our solar system, they shouldn't exist. The closest thing in our solar system to the sun is Mercury, and that orbits with a period of about 90 days. And so these planets in these tiny little orbits like this are just like, who ordered that? We weren't expecting it. In fact, there are stories about, um, there are stories about astronomers trying to use this method to find planets around other stars and basically almost giving up because they couldn't find anything. The, the, it was partially because the observations weren't good enough yet. The error bars here are pretty big. This is um, meters per second, tens of meters per second, but also because they weren't looking at these very short periods. And once they started looking at these very short periods, a bunch more planets popped up. 
We've also improved our techniques. We've started observing for longer amounts of time, or we've continued observing for longer amounts of time. And so we now know about more and more planets. But these hot Jupiters are a, a new type of planet that we didn't know about in our own solar system. So the transit method is an even simpler method of discovering planets. So the animation that um, goes on here is the line moves across, and it, it stays at a, approximately the same brightness, and then it dips for a little bit. And the little shadow of a planet moves in front of the star. And so it's a very simple observation to make. All you have to do is measure the brightness of a star over a certain amount of time. And as a planet passes in between us and the star orbiting that star, the light dips by a tiny little bit. The brightness decreases, and then it goes back again once the planet passes the star. And if that happens multiple times with the same amount of time in between, then you have the orbital period of the planet around a star. And so instead of taking spectra over and over and over again, you just have to monitor the brightness of a star. And so this is something that's a little bit easier to do, and in fact, easier to do for large numbers of stars as well. Um, and so one of the spacecraft, that, one of the, the, the big missions to do this is the Kepler Space Telescope that's still in orbit around the sun. The main mission is ended, um, but it's, it's re-going as, I don't like to call it zombie Kepler, they don't call it zombie Kepler, they call it K2 officially. Um, and this is one of the first planetary systems that was discovered by Kepler. So Kepler actually, well, um, the, the original mission of Kepler was just to look at about 150,000 stars in one part of the sky. Just point at that one part of the sky. I keep holding my hand out like this because if you held your hand up by the right constellations, that about covered the Kepler field of view. And Kepler just stared at that region of the sky, monitoring the brightness of about 100,000 stars. And this is one of the very first papers that came out in 2011 showing one of the first multiple planet systems that they detected. So up at the top is brightness versus time. And you can see it looks a little bit messy. There's big jumps, there's um, spikes, there's gaps, there's um, um, you know, kind of ski hills in between. But understanding the instrument and understanding the telescope, you can do what's called detrending the flux, the brightness of the star. And you can see that the changes in flux go from a few percent or so to just tiny fractions of a percent. There's a lot more 0.999s over there in this detrended flux. But there's still, it looks like, little raindrops every once in a while. And in fact, every single one of these dips is where a planet has passed in front of the star decreasing the brightness of the star. And in fact, the astronomers have gone through and these colored dots at the bottom, each one of the colored dots labels one of the dips, and the different colors correspond to different planets. You can see that each of the colored dots are spaced kind of evenly. So the yellow is evenly spaced, the blue is evenly spaced here, there's even cyan evenly spaced, and then a gray even further apart. And so once you add up all of those, each, one's a, each time the planet passes in front of the star, it's called a transit. And so if you take all those transits for those different planets and put them all together, you actually have a six planet system. And you can see that the planets are different sizes. So the amount of light that the, st that the planet blocks from, by the, from the star determines how deep the dip is. And so planet B up there is a little bit smaller. Planet G down here is a little bit bigger. It blocks out. The bigger the planet, the more light gets blocked out. And there's an artist's representation for this as well, a six-planet system around a sun-like star. These are also relatively small um, orbital periods. So the planets are also relatively close to their star. This is about 400 days worth of data. And you can see that every single planet, even the, the furthest out one, transits one, two, three, four times. And so the, the largest period is still less than 100 days or so. So these are also a tightly packed system within the orbit of Mercury or so, um, if it were in the solar system. And the thing that I love about this artist's representation is that this three transit event, where three planets are in front of the star at the same time, actually happened. There's one particular date in here where you can pick out three of the planets transiting at once, which is super, super cool. OK, so th um, those two methods are observing the star, seeing the star change, seeing the brightness change, seeing the spectrum movement back and forth, and then backing out the information about the planet. I should have said with the, with the wobble method, we can determine the period and the mass of the planet. With the transit method, we can determine the, um, 
the period and the size of the planet, the physical extent of the planet. But there's another method for directly for detecting exoplanets, and that is taking a picture of the exoplanet, which is easier than it sounds. So this is, I just love this image. Um, I helped to revise a textbook recently, and I insisted that the, to, the, to the main author that we put this image in, and he was like, oh, that's such a ratty image, and like, he didn't like this data. And I was like, no, this is the best. You don't understand what goes into this. And so this is actually a picture of a solar system. The kind of, kind of messiness in the very center is where the light from the star used to be. So normal, if we try to take a, a picture of a star or a picture of a solar system, the star washes out everything. It's like a, a bright light in a picture. It just makes the whole picture too bright. You don't see any of the details. And so what astronomers have to do is actually correct and then remove the starlight in order to, to let the planets shine through. And these planets are millions, sometimes they're even billions of times fainter than the star that was out there in the center. Um, and so this, this is a multiple planet system. You can see they're labeled B, C, D, and E. And the arrows show I think something like 20 years of, of orbital, predicted orbital motion for these objects. Um, but these directly imaged exoplanets, we, the planets have to be pretty massive. So this isn't reflected light like we see planets in in our own solar system. This is actually a light emitted by the planets themselves. So the planets are massive, they're relatively young, and so they're still a little bit hot from formation. And so they're, they're kind of more massive than Jupiter. Each one of these is about uh, five to 10 times the mass of Jupiter, approximately. And the star is something like 30 to 40 million years old. Um, and so because these things are massive, young, and relatively hot, they're going to be, we think, relatively similar to brown dwarfs. Um, but this is a picture. And you might wonder, how good can we get spectra of these objects in order to tell something a little bit more of what they're like, about what their temperatures are like, what's in their atmospheres, and those other things that we might be interested in. And the answer is not very well. Because these, the, this particular instrumentation, we can't get very good spectra of these objects. Because we've had to correct and remove the starlight. We're very limited as to the, the data that we can get from the rest of the planets that are left over. But it turns out that these objects are very similar to brown dwarfs. And the brown dwarfs we can understand in a lot more detail, like I hinted at earlier. And in fact, we think that their atmospheres are going to be relatively similar. And therefore, we can use the brown dwarfs to understand the exoplanet atmospheres. Just to show you what we think some of these atmospheres are like, I've got kind of three panels of, of atmospheres at different temperatures, from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom, from up to down. And we have Jupiter over on the far side, and then uh, kind of a hotter brown dwarf here and a cooler brown dwarf here. Um, you can see that they're kind of similar in composition. We have carbon monoxide dominating over here. Then the carbon monoxide goes lower and lower in the atmosphere. And you have methane higher in the atmosphere, and then ammonia clouds even higher up in Jupiter. But we've got kind of similar um, um, makeup of the clouds. Perovskite and corundum are um, minerals that actually can form in these atmospheres. You've got iron metal liquids. You've got chloride clouds. You've got ammonia clouds and, and sulfide clouds in Jupiter. Um, and so we can study these in a lot of detail in the brown dwarfs and to a certain extent in Jupiter as well. And then we can take this understanding and apply it to the very limited data that we can get from the exoplanets. Um, oh, and that also explains the dress that I'm wearing. <laughs> So this image, the image on the left of Jupiter, is actually a relatively new image of Jupiter from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and the brown dwarfs, I've showed you over and over again that these, these brown dwarfs, especially the coolest ones, we tend to color them purple because they're so cool and they're so faint and the, the light really only gets emitted in the infrared. Um, and there was a woman who was making sciencey dresses, and I said, you know, there's the, here's this beautiful picture of Jupiter's atmosphere, but I wonder, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's kind of brown, it's kind of orange, but I was like, I really like purple. And really it was because I wanted it to be like a brown dwarf. And so I said, can you make this Jupiter dress and make it purple? And she said, yes, I can. And she <laughs> did. And I bought one, and you can buy one too. So the company is called Shinova, and they make all kinds of awesome stuff. Um, she makes uh, peri peri dresses with a periodic table on it, dresses with wormholes on it. Um, if you've ever seen anybody give a talk about LIGO or gravitational waves, she made a fantastic gravitational wave dress that I know has been worn at several TEDx talks. 
Um, and so even, you know, it's, it's definitely Jupiter because you've got the great red spot turned purple right here. But so you can actually buy this on the internet. It's not even a, a special order anymore. And you know, she calls it the purple Jupiter dress or something like that, but very secretly, it's actually a brown dwarf dress. Um, so to go back to some of these, the, the, some of my favorite exoplanets, um, this one that I showed you first was actually the very first multiple exoplanet system that was discovered. Um, this is just one near-infrared observation, um, but there have been spectra taken of some of these planets since then. And this star is an A5 star, so a higher mass star than the sun. And there, like I said, there's four or five to ten Jupiter mass planets around this star. Um, very intriguingly, so this is 20 AU at the bottom as that tick mark, which is about the orbit of um, uh, Uranus, I believe. And so this is kind of like a scaled up solar system, if you will. The, the star is bigger and the star is hotter. And these planets are bigger and further away from its star. But they receive about the same amount of radiation from their star that, that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune receive from our sun, which is probably a coincidence, but also relatively interesting, pretty interesting as well. Um, another star that we've directly imaged a planet around is this one called Beta Pictoris. I love Beta Pictoris for two reasons. One of them is because we can also see this fantastic disk around Beta Pictoris, so it's a young enough star that it still has a lot of a disk. And this planet, and so it's kind of, this image is kind of two separate infrared images put together. And the planet is right here, and the planet is actually getting closer and closer to its star in this direction, kind of following the plane of the disk as well. And you might think, oh my goodness, is that planet going to pass directly in front of the star? That would be super cool. And the answer is that it's not going to pass. It's super, super close. It's not going to exactly pass in front of the star, but it will come close. And if that planet has rings or moons that are further away from the star, those could, or further away from the planet itself, those could pass in front of the star. And astronomers will be watching. So there's actually special instrumentation and telescopes set up, I believe, this summer to watch the transit and, or to watch for a transit, basically. It won't be the planet that transits, but it might be the moons, um, if there are moons around that planet, or rings, which would be very, very exciting. Um, another planet that I want to show you is uh, uh, one of the lowest mass ones that we know about. It's an F0 star, so still a little bit hotter than the sun, with a two Jupiter mass planet around it. So the star is called 51 Eridanus, and the planet is B. This is just a little gif of, of two different observations showing the planet moving. And then on the other side, it's labeled with the size of Saturn's orbit around the sun to scale. And so this is really not that much bigger than the solar system. We're starting to be able to see solar systems the size of our own, really, which is very exciting. You know, the planets are a little bit bigger. The systems are younger in order to see those planets, but it's not that much bigger. Um, and this image is specifically from an instrument that was built to find planets, which is why it's called the Gemini Planet Imager. It's on the Gemini Telescope, um, the Gemini South Telescope in Chile. Um, but what's really exciting to me, so I promised I would show you the spectra, and here in blue are the spectra from that particular instrument of the planet itself. And so this is one wavelength regime and then a second observation over here showing water and methane in the atmosphere of that planet. So we can actually get at a spectrum of this exoplanet, which I think is just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, but even more importantly for me as a primarily brown dwarf scientist, so the observations of the planet are in blue, and the, um, a spectrum of a field T dwarf is here in yellow. And so you can see that spectrum of the T dwarf matches with the observations of that exoplanet very, very beautifully. And that's where my job security comes in. We really do need the brown dwarf spectra to understand these exoplanet spectra because this, is, this blue is really the best spectrum we're going to be able to get from an exoplanet for a long, long time. But for the brown dwarfs, we have tons more spectra. We can do many more observations, get a lot more detailed observations, and really apply all of that understanding to understanding these new worlds around other stars. Hugely, hugely exciting to me. But wait, there's more. Because not only, so we have the sun, and we have these very low mass stars. And what I just spent maybe half an hour telling you about is that these low mass stars and the brown dwarfs, even cooler and even lower mass, 
are exciting because they start to get very similar to gas giant exoplanets. But I also hinted at the very beginning of that tiny little picture of Earth. And really, I know, uh, at least for me, these gas giant planets, these planets that we, we don't have in our solar system are exciting in order to understand the huge um, diversity of planets that we have in our universe. But what we really want to get at, right, is, is an Earth-like planet. This is really where all the money is, especially now. Um, and if you think back to that transit method where the video didn't work, but we're blocking off the light from the, um, the planet is blocking out the light from the stars. Imagine this little dinky planet is not blocking out very much light from the sun. It's actually just a tiny fraction of 1%. But if you put that same Earth in orbit around a smaller star, this Earth-sized planet, this, is, this one is Earth, but an Earth-sized planet is going to block out a lot more light from this very small star. So in fact, finding small planets, if that's what you're interested in, and a lot of us are, finding small planets is going to be easier around small stars. Both because the star is small, like I'm showing in this picture, but also because in order for this, the planet to be at a, a nice toasty temperature, so in what we call the habitable zone where the Earth happens to be around the sun, because these stars are so cool, that planet can be a lot closer in to still be the right temperature to have liquid water on its surface. And so having it closer in is also going to have it orbit faster and have a shorter period. And so that'll make it easier for us to find that planet. But first, we have to find the stars. And so this star, in fact, this one has a very specific name. It's called 2 mass 2306, um, blah, 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 dash, blah, blah, blah. Everybody knows it, right? You know, you, you know this one. Some of you might. But you probably know this one by another name. Thanks to this guy, John Gizus. I think he left already. But I'm, you can all tell him that I embarrassed him. This star is called TRAPPIST-1. Now have you heard about it? Yeah. And why have you heard about it? Because of the seven dwarves around it. But we wouldn't know. So this is the artist representation. Again, we, we don't actually don't go buying any extra solar real estate quite yet. I always joke that these are like apartment listings in New York City. Like, never believe the pictures. Never believe the pictures of the Earth-like exoplanets. They're really promising and that, you know, we, we try to put as much information into, into them as we can. And in fact, I, th I think these three is a D, E, and F that are in the habitable zone. These are they're relatively small planets in, and about half of them are in the habitable zone around the stars. So that's super exciting. You know, that one's too close. This one's probably an icy water world. Um, but a bunch of them are potentially habitable, which is very exciting. But in order to find these planets, you've got to find the stars first. And you know, for a little while, this was kind of boring, not super exciting cataloging jobs. But now, um, more recently, it, it merits press releases, which is really fun. Um, but to come back to the issue of, so this is still, you know, now we have a very low mass star with some very small planets around it. And so even though the, the star is very different from the sun, the planets are small enough where it still seems like, OK, very obviously a, a star and a bunch of planets around it. But actually, there's a bunch of binary systems that kind of blur the lines between a star and a planetary system <clears throat> and a binary star system. So here's a handful of these. And in fact, a lot of these I've showed you before. Um, this is the HR 8799 system that actually has four planets, but this is old enough that it only has three. The sun here with the four gas giant planets around it. Um, and higher up, uh, some very low mass star and brown dwarf, and even a brown dwarf, brown dwarf binary. Um, and it's hard to see, but under each one of the planets is a little number in parentheses. So 7, 10, and 10 for Jupiter masses of the HR 8799 planets. Um, smaller, even fractions of a Jupiter mass, but Jupiter is 1 um, for the masses of these planets. And then at the very top, it's 0.025. Um, and but that's in, so that's in solar masses for the stars. And then five Jupiter masses here for the companion. And I want to show you that system in particular, because that one really, for me, uh, very much blurs the line. So this is the primary object is one of the first brown dwarfs that was discovered, um, or one of the first young brown dwarfs, I sh should say, that was discovered. Um, but more recently, when we looked at it, um, we could see, with better instrumentation, we could see a companion object. So the primary brown dwarf is about 75 Jupiter masses. The companion object is only five Jupiter masses. And this, for me, is kind of the, it's like a litmus test of, of what astronomers believe. Because when you ask them that, you're like, OK, is that a star and a planet? 
well, no, it's, it's definitely not a star because it's a brown dwarf. It's less than 75 Jupiter masses. Then is that five Jupiter mass thing a planet? And it's like, well, it's below 13 Jupiter masses, but you know, they're still pretty close in mass. They're only five times, one is five times the mass of the other. So did they form together? Did they form, did, did the little one actually form in the disk around the big one? It's awfully big to have formed in a, in a little disk around a 25 Jupiter mass object. Did they form like a binary star system? This one is really ambiguous, and I think you can have a lot of different answers for what this system is, and this really gets at what we don't necessarily know or understand about these objects. They're relatively young. Um, they're something like 10 or 15 million years old, but we still don't, you know, we can't go back in time and see how they formed, and so we, we still have to make our definitions work so that we can understand this system. Um, and so I hope I've convinced you that, number one, brown dwarfs are cool, maybe quite literally or figuratively as well, cooler than the coolest stars, but they're also these fantastic exoplanet analogs in order to understand gas giant planets around other stars, as well as to, to find um, their, their great places to look for Earth-like planets, Earth-sized planets around nearby stars. So their atmospheres and physical properties are similar despite, despite the fact that they formed in different ways. Um, but these brown dwarfs are more numerous and much easier to study than the exoplanets are because those exoplanets are on other stars. And so really by understanding the brown dwarfs, they'll help us understand the gas giant planets around other stars. Um, and I'd like to finish with some fun stuff that I do. So the, I, I do have to admit that this isn't the only um, astronomy-themed clothing that I wear. And I, it's a, a little bit of a ringer because I actually have a whole astronomy-themed fashion blog. And so there, there's a whole universe of astronomy-themed fashion where this came from. Um, I also sometimes do astronomy presentations at bars. We call it Astronomy on Tap. Um, there's actually one going on right now in Brooklyn, in New York City, that I left behind. But it, it's also a crossover event because it's called Dinosaurs on Tap. And they're actually talking about dinosaurs and not strictly astronomy. Um, and I have made some... Uh, science parody videos, including one you might have caught at the, little, at the very beginning in my group photo of my research group, this little guy, which is like a, a knit thing with arms and legs with a beach ball inside that we call Little BD, and he's kind of our brown dwarf mascot. Um, and he actually has a, a music video as well. So if you Google too small to be a star, you'll find stuff about Lionel Messi, but then you'll also find on YouTube this, this uh, video that I made in an exoplanet conference. Um, or at an exoplanet and brown dwarf conference, and he has his own Twitter feed as well. Um, just in case you didn't think that astronomers were fun. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully we have some time to take questions.